bow our heads, please. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you for this day and all your blessings. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together to worship thee, Father. Father, we ask you to be with those that have mentioned that are sick. Please restore them back to their much wanted health. Be with those who have an upcoming medical procedures. Please watch care of them, Father. All these blessings, and we thank you for our blessings that you've given us, Father. It's in your sins name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. Number 93, our first song, Christ for the World We Sing. <clears throat> Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with loving zeal, the poor and them that mourn, the fade and overborn, sin, sick and sorrow born, whom Christ doth heal. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with fervent prayer, the wayward and the lost by restless passions tossed, redeemed at countless cost from dark despair. Christ for the world we sing, the world in Christ we bring, with one accord, with us the work to share, with us reproach to dare, with us the cross to bear for Christ our Lord. Christ for the world we sing, the world in Christ we bring, with joyful song, the newborn souls whose days reclaim from error ways, inspired with hope and praise to Christ belong. Amen. Our song before our prayer is The Battle Belongs to the Lord, number 977. <clears throat> In heavenly armor we'll enter the land, the battle belongs to the Lord. No weapons that fashion against us will stand, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, power, power and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in hard, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory. Honor, power and strength to the Lord. 
we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. Amen. Would you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for blessing us with the desire, the opportunity to mind to assemble this morning and study another portion of your word. We thank you so much for your word, for your son Jesus, who was willing to die on a cross for the sins of the world. We are so blessed, and we thank you so much for uh, the two ministers we have, Daniel and Doug, as they work with us here and their families. We pray that you will continue to bless them Strengthen them in your word, and, and uh, as they go about their work, that they will strengthen us. We pray for the leaders of the church, leaders of the world. We pray that you will bless and uh, strengthen them, that they will, decisions they make will be according to your will. We pray for those who are having medical problems at this time, uh, procedures coming up, surgeries, we pray that you will bless them and bless the, the health care professionals as they work with them, that they will uh, you'll bless them with the skills and the, the knowledge to do what's best for them, that their health will be restored. We pray for those who are maybe uh, still uh, breathing the loss of uh, loved ones, we pray that you will bless and strengthen and comfort them. We pray that uh, as we go through this service that you will uh, bless us in your word and as we leave here we will go out into the world and as people see the things that we do then hear the things that we say, that they will know that we are Christians and, and that they will want to be a part of what we have in Jesus and that they will give you the glory in all things. We pray for the men and women who are in the military, the uh, first responders. We pray that you will bless and strengthen them as they are out into the, the communities, the, the the world in, in sometimes uh, difficult places that uh, you will bless them and keep them safe and, and that they will uh, always return to their family safe and find them safe. We pray that uh, you will continue to watch over us and uh, that we will always look to you for all things. We pray all this through your son Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Brother Bob. The psalm before the offering, number 716, Walking Alone at Eve, 716. <clears throat> Walking alone at Eve and viewing the skies afar, Bidding the darkness come to welcome each silver star. I have a great delight in the wonderful scenes above. God in his power and might, he showing his truth and love. Over all with God, a place in his courts to rest. Sure and I say forward with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul once reading by the Savior's love. Where I'll be pure and whole and live with my God above. Sitting alone at Eve and dreaming the hours away. Watching the shadows falling now at the close of day. 
God in his mercy comes with his word he is drawing near. Spreading his love and truth and round me and everywhere. Over a home with God, a place in his courts to rest. Sharing a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul once redeemed by the Savior's love. Where I'll be pure and hold and live with my God above. Closing my eyes at eve and thinking of heaven's grace. Longing to see my Lord, yes, meeting him face to face. Trusting him as my all, wheresoever my footsteps roam. Pleading with him to guide me unto the Spirit's home. Over a home with God, a place in his courts to rest. Sure in a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul, once redeemed by the Savior's love. Where I've been pure and whole, and live with my God above. Amen. As we prepare to return to God a portion of which he's blessed us with, the scriptures tell us how we are to give. We find in Exodus, the 25th chapter, verse 2. Speak to the children of Israel that they may bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart. You shall take my offering. And we also find in 2 Corinthians, the 9th chapter, verse 7. Let each one give as he purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's go to God in prayer. God, our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings you've given to us throughout our lives, the ability we have to earn a living to support ourselves and our families. You have blessed us beyond measure. Now, Heavenly Father, we return to you a portion which you bless us with. May we do so cheerfully, lovingly, as we purpose in our hearts, so that you will receive the honor and glory, and the kingdom can continue to grow here in the middle of Georgia area. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm before the Lord's Supper, number 859. <clears throat> he paid a debt. 
He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, amazing grace. Christ is a spade of death that I could never pay. He paid that debt at Calvary, he cleansed my soul and set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins erase. I now can sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a death that I could never pay. One day he's coming back for me to live with him eternally. Would it be glory to see him on that day? I then will sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a death that I could never pay. As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, we need to think about what Christ has done for us and what he did to die and dying for us and what he went through. I would like to read from Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, verses 7 through 9. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generations? For he was cut off from the, hand, from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich at his death. But he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Let's go to God in prayer. God, our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us, especially for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, suffered and died the cruel death on the cross so that we could have forgiveness of our sins. Now, if we partake of this bread which represents his body, may we think back to what he did and what he went through because of our sins. And may each of us think, Christ died because of my sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let's go God in prayer. God, our loving Heavenly Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine which represents Christ's blood, the blood that was shed on the cross, the blood that forgives our sins, Heavenly Father, may we do so remembering that Christ died for us because of our sins. We thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for his willingness to die that we could have hope for eternity with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. you mark for our invitation song number 727 that that is the wrong song that is going to be the closing song what you see but mark for your invitation song number 727 we shall see the king someday Number 727 is our closing song. Now would you turn to number 859, or excuse me, I'm sorry, number 530. Number 530 is our song before the lesson. Peace, perfect peace. Would you stand with me, please? Peace, perfect peace in this dark world of sin. The blood of Jesus whispers peace within. Peace, perfect peace by thronging duties press. To do the will of Jesus, this is his rest. Peace, perfect peace, with sorrow surging round on Jesus' bosom, not but come in. Perfect peace with loved ones far away and Jesus.
Jesus, keeping we are safe and they. Peace, perfect peace, our future all unknown. Jesus, we know and he is on the shall cease, and Jesus call us to his perfect peace. Please be seated. I'll be reading from Matthew 5, verses 23 through 24. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Good morning. Good to see this fine audience this morning. I appreciate you being here. Thankful that we have this opportunity to worship God in spirit and in truth. And if you're visiting with us, we want you to know that you're our honored guest. I, we hope that we get to know you better. And uh, if you're new in the area or live in the area, we'd love for you to come and worship with us and be a part of us. Walter was born in America's heartland. He was born in Iowa. His father was a corn farmer. And when we say that Walter was born on the farm, he was literally born in a farmhouse in 1921. He would go on to be the oldest of five brothers in the family. He lived on the farm. And so from a very early age in Walter's life, it was expected that, Alt, uh, that Walter would uh, pull his load on the farm. In fact, sometimes as we would look out at Walter, we would see that he wasn't much taller than the five-gallon bucket he was trying to, to move around there. But he would have a pail. He would help with feeding the hogs and helping with the milk cows and uh, getting eggs from the chicken. He was born on a farm, and he was expected to work. And so he would grow up on this farm, and his father was a farmer as well. Walter's dad was a hard man. Walter in his life didn't get a lot of positive reinforcement. He was taught how to work, and it was work sun up to sundown. It was work rain or shine. It was work in the snow or in the sleet. Walter was taught to work, but his dad wasn't much for patience. And his dad wasn't much for showing Walter the right way to do things and then trying to, to gently guide Walter along a path where Walter could do a job efficiently. Walter's dad was quick to criticize. Walter's dad very rarely, if ever, said, good job, son. You did a great day's work. Excellence and perfection was what was expected of Walter. Walter's dad would drink at times. And being uh, raised on a farm, there were things that were broken. In fact, there was something always broken on the farm, and so they had to improvise. Walter's dad was often angry because things were often broken on the farm, and so sometimes Walter's dad would take it out on Walter. This is the environment that Walter grew up in. Eventually, the man that Walter admired, the man that Walter looked up to, the man that was his father, the one that he loved and tried to please him, Eventually, that relationship began to erode, and eventually it began to crack, and eventually the resentment grew so deep in Walter's life that at age 15, Walter left home. Walter went and lived on a farm in Illinois for three years. Wasn't 18 yet. 
but he lived and he worked on another farm in another state, and he worked in Illinois, and eventually he went to Chicago, and he found some work in a factory there in Chicago. Walter left home, and he was gone for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Walter's younger brother wanted to find Walter, and so when Walter's brother, younger brother hit 70, he said, I'm going to find my brother. He said, I don't want to die without seeing him and without knowing what's going on in his life. And he had made attempts throughout his life to get in touch with Walter, but he couldn't find him. Eventually, he found him. He had changed his name. He wanted a fresh start. He wanted to start over, and so he had changed his name, and he had, he had very little, if any, contact with his family for 40 years. But his brother said, before I die, I want to find him. Eventually, Walter came home. He came home 50 years after leaving home at age 15. Nothing in that Iowa farm town was the same. Walter had conflict in his life. And Walter did what he could to try to deal with that conflict in his life. How about you this morning? You ever have conflict in your life? You ever have a co-worker that you ever uh, have cross words or, or uh, someone that you just don't consistently see to eye, to eye with? Do you ever have uh, maybe somebody in your own family that, that you just don't seem to, to be on the same page very often? And, and maybe it's a boss or maybe it's a co-worker or a family member or every relationship is susceptible to some form of conflict. What if you had a few moments of the Lord's time and he sat us down and he said, here's how, here's how I want you to deal with conflict in your life. That's the point of this lesson this morning because all of us have it. Whether it's in a work setting or in a family setting or in a friendship or in some group that we find ourselves in, there, we don't have to go very far or look very hard to find conflict in our life. This morning, I want us to take a few minutes and look into God's Word and see what God has to say about how we can resolve conflict in our life. If you had a few moments of the Savior's time this morning, He would tell us, as we look into His Word, that conflict is the big issue between heaven and earth. When we start thinking about uh, what separates heaven from earth and what separates man from God, at the core of that is conflict, and that conflict in God's eyes is called sin. It's a big problem between heaven and earth, and it's why, Jesus sent his, uh, it's why God sent his Son into the world so that the world could have peace with heaven. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, For if, we while, if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying is that this relationship that was once hostile, this wrath relationship between heaven and earth, has now been made a peaceful one by the offering, by the atonement, by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You were an enemy... Now you're reconciled. You were at odds with God. Now you're at with peace with God. How? By the precious blood. By the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. When Paul characterizes his ministry as an ambassador for the Lord, he characterizes his ministry as an apostle of Jesus Christ, as one who is bringing peace from heaven to mankind. Notice what he says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Here is a, a relationship that is at odds. We, living upon this earth, accountable before God, our sins offend God and our sins come before God, and God will, have, will pour out wrath and vengeance on those sins, but that's not the end of it. Here is an ambassador for peace. 
Here is Paul, who is an ambassador for reconciliation, to, to bring two worlds together that are separated by sin. It involves a sacrifice. It involves an atonement. And so when we think about the great conflict, the conflict of all ages, the conflict of all times, it is at the core caused by sin. And earth's problem needs a heavenly and divine solution. And so Jesus was sent into the world. When we think about conflict, we can think about it in two ways. One way is to think about a, a distancing of ourselves from God himself. A division between ourselves and, and, and God because of sin. Or we can think about conflict as a distancing between ourselves and other people that's caused by sin. In both of those instances, it's caused by sin. If we were to have a conversation with our Lord about conflict, he would tell us that this is the big problem. This is the big issue. Number two, in dealing with conflict, it's important that you and I understand and that we adhere to the lines of conflict and peace that God, that God ordains. In Matthew, excuse me, in John chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus would say this. He would say that in the world you will have tribulation. That's conflict. In this world you will have tribulation, but he says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. There's going to be this constant turmoil and conflict that sin causes, and there'll be, there'll be sinners, and there'll be outcomes and consequences because of their sin. There'll be pain, and there'll be suffering, and there'll be anguish that's caused by this. In this world, you'll have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He also says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. What are you saying, Lord? What are you teaching us? The Lord is teaching us that the gospel, by its very essence and nature, is a gospel that is confrontational. It challenges the very core, the very fiber of our being. And when we hear the word of God and we decide to follow it, we have peace with God in heaven. But when we hear the word of God and we reject it, then we are at odds with him. And it's not peace that we have. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, the Bible says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15, the Bible says, And his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And so on one hand, we have God saying, You're going to have tribulation. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have trials in life. And even in, within your own home, there's going to be distance. There's going to be differences. There's going to be conflict. And there may not be peace in your own dwelling place. And then on the other hand, we have Jesus saying, blessed are the peacemakers. We have Paul painting this picture of this soldier with shoes that are put on his feet that are taking the gospel of peace to, to the world. What's the point that I'm getting at? There will be this trial in life. There will be times in our life when, when the easy thing to do will, to have, will be to have peace with the world because we may not be feeling the pain from God so much. There will be times when it's easier to go with the, the masses than it is to go upstream in our life. There will be times when, when Satan will tempt us with, with having peace with the world instead of having peace with God. And we stand at the crossroads and we'll make a decision either to have peace there are things in this world that do not come together. Light, walking in the light, and the darkness, those never come together. Those never have peace. Satan, who is the father of this world, and God, who is the heavenly father, they don't have peace. They are at odds. Bitterness and sweetness. They don't have peace. They stand at odds. And we can see that, that in the world that there is, there is walking according to the flesh. 
and there's walking according to the Spirit. There are the works of the flesh. There is the fruit of the Spirit. And these are at odds with one another. These don't reconcile. They don't come together. So you and I, as we think about conflict this morning, we have a decision to make. Will I have peace with God? And can I lay my head down at night knowing that, hey, if, if the world, if I stand at odds with my family or with the world or with a coworker, but I have peace with God. Will I be content and will I be satisfied that that's good enough? You see, there will be this pressure that's put upon you to have peace with the world and conflict with God. And we must not flip those. We must say, okay, if I can't go along with you on abortion. I can't have, if you believe that abortion is acceptable, you and I can't have peace on that matter. If you believe that homosexual unions are, are acceptable, if you believe that drunkenness is acceptable, if you stand at odds with God on certain subjects, uh, I can't compromise the Word of God to have peace with you. We will be at conflict. The sword, right? The sword. I came not to bring peace, Jesus said, but a sword. There will be uh, swords that exist in our life where I have to make a decision. I can't stand with man and all the ways that man divides himself uh, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of, of skin color, in terms of, of, of money, in terms of wealth and social status, all these things that divide us. In Christ Jesus, I have to say, there is a peace that passes understanding. And if I have peace with God, that's enough. And I can lay my head down at night knowing that if I'm at odds with my fellow man, it's because I'm trying to bring them the gospel and they're resisting it. But what about instances in our life? As we think about peace with heaven, what about instances in our life where we are at odds with our fellow man? What about when I'm in a conflict with my brother or with my sister in Christ? Or, or what about when either I've sinned against them or they've sinned against me? What would God have me to do to reconcile in those instances? If we were to look in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 21, the scriptures say, You have heard that it was said to those of old. You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry, this is the anger of man. It does not produce the righteousness of God, but this is the anger of man. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother, the King James says, whoever says raka. This word uh, literally means uh, empty-headed. Whoever, he says, whoever insults his brother, calls him an empty head, if you will, will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool, this Greek word is the Greek word more, where we get our word moron from. Whoever calls him, whoever says you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Verse 23, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, Here's this picture that Jesus is painting. It's a picture that is for Jews. It's a picture where the Jews are going to offer, make an offering to God. And as they go and make their offering, they remember that their brother or their sister has aught with them. That is, that they have, they have been offended. This person remembers their sin. They remember the division. They remember the wedge that, that is there. They know and are, are consciously aware of the lack of peace that exists between them and another individual. And as, they, as they're cognizant of that, as they become aware, Jesus would say, Jesus would say, leave your gift, therefore, before the altar and go. Leave your gift, therefore, before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accusers while you're going with him to court, lest, you will, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. What's Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that sometimes folks are going to be at odds with one another. 
He says, notice what he says. He says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and remember that your brother has something, what could this something be? This is something I I could submit to you as Jesus is speaking to Jews and in a Jewish context. He's talking about some issue that they have regarding the law of Moses. As you're going to offer your gift and you remember that you're in violation of the law of Moses or that you've offended your brother, you are the sinner in this instance. You've afflicted them in some way. You've caused some pain. You've caused some hurt. You've caused some damage. By your actions. Jesus says it is your obligation. It is your obligation to go. If you're the sinner, you're to go. And we see the great pictures of this in Scripture. We see with the prodigal son, we see the prodigal, the sinner, going back into the graces and the loving arms of his father. We see the pictures of Jacob having stolen his brother's Esau, uh, his birthright. And as they meet on that road, and as, as Jacob uh, 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 bows down before him, and we see them in tears, and, and we see them uniting, and we see Jacob insisting that his brother take this offering, take this gift, take this present. We see Esau trying to resist that. Jacob insisting on it. Accept my, my peace offering, if you will. Here's this picture that Jesus is painting, that when we have sinned against someone else, our obligation, in no uncertain terms, is to go and to try, to the very best of our ability, to make those things right. We can't make that other person forgive us. We can't make those other people forgive us if we've offended many in our actions and in our life. But our obligation, Jesus says, is to go to them. Well, what if we're on the other side of the coin? What if instead of us being the sinner that has offended someone else, what if, in fact, we are the ones who have been hurt? What if we find ourselves on the other side of the coin? In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15, the Bible says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Does that always happen? In the body of the Lord's church, does this always happen? Have you ever been around individuals that are quick to talk about each other? but they are unwilling to talk to each other? Have you ever been around individuals that, uh, you know, they, they want to explain to you the, the pain or the hurt, or, and, and rightfully so? There are some serious injuries that are caused by all sorts of things that happen in people's lives. Sometimes folks are, are much more willing to talk about each other or at each other even, rather than to each other. But you see God's divine wisdom in this. God cares about both sets of souls. He cares about the sinner. He cares about the one who has sinned against. And in both instances, the obligation in God's mind is for us to go and to try to make those things right. He says, verse 15, go and tell him his fault. So here's how those things will happen. Hey, you know, uh, what you did, uh, you really offended me here. I, I, uh, uh, well, I was just joking. Well, your jokes kind of sting. What what you said to me, uh, or, and and really even the way that you looked at me, maybe it wasn't even a word, maybe it was a, a condescending look, or Or the body language, right? Maybe it was shaking the head or wagging the head. Or or maybe I saw you whispering and and I heard my name as you're whispering to somebody else. and And I took great offense at that. I want to make things, I want you to make things right with me. I've been offended. I've been hurt. You go and tell them their fault between you and them alone. The Bible says that's what we... We must do. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But 
verse 16, if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So if you and them alone, as you discuss this matter, if there seems to be no peace there, hey, you've offended me. Here's a sin in your life that I, I see that's going on, and, and, and I want to make those things right. And then they say, no, it's no big deal. You need to get over it. You need to get over it. Pick it up, buttercup, right? <laughs> if they're unwilling, right, to, to admit, if they're unwilling to take accountability, what do you do? Verse 16 says, you take one or two others with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And then if they refuse, verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What's the point? God cares about sin in the life of his people. He cares when you upset other people. He cares when your actions, your inactions, your body language. He cares about that impact that it has on somebody else. And it may be the case, maybe the case that I'm not even aware that when I said your name, as I whispered in the corner, maybe I was complimenting you and you took it maybe wrong. Maybe, uh, maybe what I did in my look or in my joking that, that uh, the only way we're going to come back together is to have these discussions and to be open. And we say sometimes, you know, I don't like conflict and I don't like confrontation. I don't, I'd, rather just, I'd rather just take it in than actually deal with it. And that's not helpful either because here's what happens sometimes. Folks will store up other people's sins. So you're offended once, and it goes into your, into your bank account of offenses. And someone else hurts you again, and it goes into your bank account of offenses. And they hurt you a third time, and these sins just keep going into your bank of offenses. And then all of a sudden, one day, one day they push the button the wrong time, and you explode. What's happened there? Now, your reaction isn't proportional to the offense that's just happened. You've been storing up your wrath, your vengeance, your, your hurt, your pain, your anger. You've been storing that up. And then one day, you're set off. And you explode, and you let it all out. And they're like, oh, wow, I didn't see that coming. The way God wants us to deal with it. Go to them alone. Go to them in private. Try to make peace the very best way that you can. I want you to think in closing this morning about a few scenarios in applying these passages so that we can have conflict with uh, res uh, reconciliation with both God and our fellow man. Let's say for illustration purposes, that you and I, we get in an argument, and we start yelling at each other, and we have all sorts of sharp words, and, and you call my mother's name, and I insult you, and you insult me, and we're just both flying off the handle, and no, neither one of us are really listening to each other. We're just, we're just uh, shouting hurt at one another. Let's say such a scenario were to, were to happen. What if nothing good would come out of such a, a verbal exchange? And what if you feel like that, that, that you're really hurt and I feel like I'm really hurt and what should we do according to Scripture? Should I just say, well, it's their job to come to me. They've hurt me. It's their job to make this right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait and wait for them to come to me and make it right. They're the ones who messed up. Or am I going to go and do what the scriptures say? When I've been sinned against, it's my job to go and to make those things right. 
You see, never at a point in time does, does Scripture say, or, or God teach us, that, that we're to wait for someone to come and try to make those offenses right with us. Why? Because God cares about their soul, too. That doesn't mean that forgiveness will actually happen, but attempts need to be made at that forgiveness. And God says that we ought to be in the bridge-building business of trying to reconcile people together. What about another situation? What if I have conflict outside the body of Christ? Brothers and sisters understand that Scripture will guide us in how to, to reconcile and how to have peace with one another. But with, what if my conflict is with an unbeliever or with maybe my boss or maybe a family member or, or with a friend who doesn't believe in God at all and, and this idea of going to them and, and, and trying to bring them to the gospel, maybe they don't even believe in the gospel. What am I to do in those situations? What if on a regular basis I'm in a work environment where my boss patronizes me? What if, on a regular basis, he's belligerent to me, or he denigrates me, or he says hurtful things about me? What if he has no regard for the Bible? What am I to do? What if I try to apply this, the principles of Scripture, and I go to them, and I say, listen, um, there's another way for you to get what you need out of me in terms of productivity without this verbal abuse? And my boss could care less about such a conversation. Even though I've made the attempt, what am I to do then? Romans chapter 12 and verse 18 says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. I'm going to take these principles that apply to believers, and I'm going to try to the greatest strength of my own ability to make peace with them the way God that would, would have me do that. I'm going to apply the golden rule. I'm going to treat them. I'm not going to be belligerent to them. I'm not going to be hateful. I'm not going to uh, be accusatory. I'm not going to defame them or denigrate. I'm going to be respectful of them because that's what I would like. I'm going to treat them with dignity and honor because that's what I would like, because that's what God would expect of me. I'm not going to gauge my behavior on how they act. I'm going to gauge my behavior on what God wants me to do. I'm going to try to make peace with them. Thirdly, what about a scenario where a crime has been committed? What about an instance where physical abuse is going on, or some violation of God's law, or civil law is going on? I wouldn't suggest, if you find yourself in a drive-by shooting, uh, to finding the gang member and saying, hey, I, I find your bullets to be a bit offensive. I, I would, there are other commands in addition to Matthew 5 and Matthew 18. God has put in our world civil authorities, Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 6, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and following. You call the law, call them. This isn't everything. Matthew 5 and Matthew 18 is not everything that's said about conflict in Scripture. But I think if we apply these principles, I think that we can be at peace with one another. And even if we make attempt after attempt after attempt at trying to have peace with somebody else, we can lay our head down at night knowing that we have peace with God and that our energies and our efforts in trying to make peace with our fellow man are not all for nothing because we're walking in the steps of the Prince of Peace. And that's why he came into this world and that's why he died. And you and I, as we live and breathe, and have our being, have a great blessing to walk in the peace that he offers. We pray with me? God, we pray as your people that we'll be people of peace. We pray, Lord, that we'll walk in the light. And we know, Lord, that sometimes confrontation is hard. We know, Lord, that sometimes 
these conversations are difficult, and we know, Lord, that sometimes we'd rather not have them. We know, Lord, that this is what you want us to do. We know, Lord, that you care about the souls of all people. Whether we've been sinned against or whether we are the sinner, we know, Lord, that you care for us and that you love us. Help us, Lord, to be willing to do things the way in which you want us to do them. Help us, Lord, to go and make things right. Help us to be bridge builders, Lord. Help us to be individuals that bring peace to this world. We know, Lord, that it's not easy. We know, Lord, that peace may not always be achieved, but help us, Lord, to take every effort we can to be in harmony with you and with our fellow man. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, we want to offer God's peace to you. We want to offer the opportunity for the Prince of Peace to come into contact with your life and to give you the peace that passes all understanding, for you to be in harmony with him now and in ages to come. If you want to be a Christian this morning, you can do it by hearing the word, believing the word, repenting of your sins, confessing the sweet name of Jesus, being buried in the watery grave of baptism. This puts you in contact with Christ's blood, with his death and with his resurrection. We're going to sing a song to encourage you, and all you need to do this morning is step out in the aisle, come down and give one of the elders your hand. Make the good confession. We'll baptize you for the remission of your sins, and you'll, you'll rise having peace with God, a peace that passes understanding. We want you to do that this morning if you're not a Christian, but if you, maybe you are a Christian, and you need peace, and you need a resolution to the conflict in your life in a public way, for any reason you need to come, won't you come as we stand and sing? On the blessed morning, clouds will disappear. We shall see the king someday. We shall see the king someday. We will shout and sing someday. Gather round the throne when he shall call his own. We shall see the king someday. After foes are conquered, after battles won, we shall see the king someday. After strife is over, after battles won, we shall see the king someday. We shall see the king someday. We will shout and sing someday. Gather round the throne when he shall call his own. We shall see the king someday. There with all the loved ones who have gone before. We shall see the king someday. After sorrow of heaven on the peaceful shore, we shall see the king someday. We shall see the king someday. We will shout and sing someday. Gather at the throne when he shall call his own. We shall see the king someday. Amen. Our closing song will be number 264. I am a stranger here. We are ambassadors of Jesus. Our home is in heaven. <clears throat> I am a stranger here within a foreign land. My home is far away upon a golden strand. Ambassador to be of ribs beyond the sea. I'm here on business for my king. This is the message that I bring. 
A message angels fain would sing. Oh, be ye reconciled, thus saith my Lord and King. Oh, be ye reconciled to God. This is the King's command that all men everywhere repent and turn away from sin's seductive snare that all who will obey with him shall reign for aye. And that's my business for my King. This is the message that I bring. A message angels fain would sing. Oh, be ye reconciled, thus saith my Lord and King. Oh, be ye reconciled to God. My home is brighter far than Sharon's rosy plain. Eternal life and joy throughout its vast domain. My sovereign bids me tell how mortals there may dwell. And that's my business for my king. This is the message that I bring. A message angels fain would sing. Oh, be ye reconciled, thus saith my Lord and King. Oh, be ye reconciled to God. Would you remain standing for a closing prayer? A quick reminder, a meeting with our young adults in the front afterwards. Also received a note that we want to add. remember Amy Haskin Hicks in our prayers. That's the uh, sister to Lucy uh, Watson and the daughter, of course, to Tom Haskins. Uh, Amy is in Cartersville Medical Hospital. Uh, she was in ICU for a week, but some better now. She's in room 323. Her lungs were bleeding. Uh, diagnosis is an autoimmune disease called ITP. Body is attacking her platelets. Very serious. Please say prayers for her. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, our glorious heavenly Father, we're grateful for this opportunity to gather together to worship you. We pray all that we did is in accordance to your will and spirit and truth. We thank you, Father, for your continued love and for your son who sacrificed that we can have this right relationship with you. We thank you, Father, for the message that was delivered today. Pray, Father, we take your word into our hearts and minds and live it daily. We're thankful, Father, for your continued providential care. Pray that you be with us as we depart. We're mindful of many who are struggling in this life, those who are in hospitals, those who are having difficulties. We pray, Father, we could be a vessel of comfort, strength, and guidance. Pray, Father, that you be with us as we depart to the next appointed time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.